I got to say, we're really lucky in British Columbia, without the active engagement of consular offices in, in the city of Vancouver, um, British Columbia would not be the state it's in on advancing the climate agenda. And there's so many great uh, uh, consular offices that have stepped up to the plate around knowledge transfer and technology transfer. Um, today we have with us uh, U.S. consular staff, um, Italian consular staff, and uh, quite significantly also Korean consular staff who are uh, uh, sponsoring this, this event. So what I would like to do uh, is right away uh, is an event, uh, invite the consular general from uh, Korea to uh, the front of the room so he can make a welcome on behalf of uh, the consular. For us, environment, climate change, uh, is a matter of survival. Uh, imagine that Korea is the size three times larger than Vancouver Island, uh, where 50 million people live. So it's a totally different environment. Uh, in, that, in that sense, when you have this kind of industri industrialization, then you must do something about the environment. You must do something about climate change. If not, you cannot survive. So that's why kind of our, our headquarter uh, wanted us to have, to have opportunities to share not only best practices, but best ideas on it. So that's why we have this event today. So thank you for all your participation. Uh, it not only benefits BC, but also benefits us. And uh, Italian Consul General Massimiliano is here for other countries too. And uh, I have one more video clip. This one handles 80 to 90 truckloads every day. This is one of five factories in Seoul that processes food waste. This machine dries the food waste and turns it into animal feed in just three hours. Another byproduct of the food recycling is biogas, a mix of methane and other gases that can be burned for energy. This plant creates enough biogas to meet 90% of its electricity needs. In the four years residents and businesses have been charged by the weight of their food waste, Seoul's overall food waste has decreased 10% by more than 300 tons a day. The Environmental Management Division hopes to triple that reduction to 30% over the next four years. So that's what, what we do. And, uh, and lastly, I like golf. <laughs> and there are something golf is related to waste. And so this is the last clip. So. It looks like an ordinary golf course, but it's also a landfill for household waste. Located in Incheon, it's known as the world's <coughs> largest waste treatment facility and landfill located in a metropolitan region. The land is a reclaimed mud flat and it's been used as a landfill since 1992 when the Nanji landfill located on Seoul's Nanji Island neared its maximum capacity. Currently, the area is not only used as a landfill but also generates renewable energy from the gas emitted by the decomposing waste. Some of the electricity is used by households and some of it is sold, bringing in around 31 million US dollars per year. The biogas is also used to fuel some 200 public buses and cleaning vehicles. Starting from the end of this year, the facility will be equipped with solar panels. Landfills used to provoke a reaction of not in my backyard, but now they're being transformed into a source of new and renewable energy. Kim Yo san Arirang News. I like golf. <laughs> <laughs> so when you combine waste to golf, it's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, please enjoy this, uh, this session. Thank you. thank you very much. Um, we really, I, I think it is quite serendipitous that uh, we were approached by uh, the consular staff with, uh, from South Korea because of their innovation around biogas and renewable natural gas. Uh, they, what's happening in the municipal sector in Korea, largely as a result of the, the scarcity of space driving this innovation is something that Canada 
and British Columbia can learn a huge amount from. It's also quite interesting that um, we, we have uh, consular staff here from Italy because Italy is also one of the major powerhouses in, in the world when it comes to the generation of, of biogas. Um, typically in places like Germany and in, um, in, in Italy, it's being combusted to generate power as it is in, in Korea. And uh, we have a very different pathway, but interestingly, that's the pathway that is being taken in Ontario. Almost all of the biogas that's being generated is being used to generate um, power. In British Columbia, with our decarbonized grid, we have other options, and it can provide other solutions. To, uh, so to give you a sense of what's going to be happening today, um, we had the opening remarks from uh, Consul General Gun Kim. Um, I'm going to make a brief um, uh, overview of uh, what's going to be happening uh, over the course of, of the day, and uh, we'll have uh, a brief introduction of the whole biogas and renewable natural gas opportunity for local governments. We'll have presentations um, from uh, three important speakers from the provincial government, from Fortis, BC, and one of the one of British Columbia and Canada's innovators on renewable natural gas, the, the city of Surrey. Uh, then what we will have is a question and answer period and, um, and, and discussion, and then we'll move into a series of questions that we are posing to you. Because one of the things that we're trying to accomplish out of this day is to get a better understanding of how to guide local governments and build their capacity. This is a, a vacant and valuable space where there isn't a heck of a lot of work going on to build local government capacity. So to give you a, a sense of uh, what that huge opportunity is, let me go down to some sli uh, slides here. Um, I'll give you a bit of an overview, but firstly, I'll, I'll just want to give you a sense of what our challenge is. This is the BC government's new climate uh, target. Um, we've kicked the can down the road. Uh, we're not going to be able to achieve our 30% emission reductions by 2010 to 20. We're far, far off. Um, we now have a much more aggressive and steeper curve that we're on to be able to achieve our 2030 targets, with a, which is a 40% reduction. Um, we, we're making very, it looks like we're making very little progress. In actual fact, in some sectors, we're making a tremendous amount of uh, progress. BC Hydro um, and local governments have done a, a great job decarbonizing our building sector. Uh, we've uh, reduced building GHGs by in the order of 20%. We've also been very, very effective in the waste sector because so many local governments are stepping up to the plate to diverse, di divert organics from landfills, and the provincial government has required um, uh, some, tight, has, has some tight regulations uh, on local governments to ensure that uh, landfill gas is either being destroyed or it's being captured and, and transformed in, into energy. One of our major challenges is the transportation sector, and renewable natural gas can play a vital, vital role in that area that's growing the most rapid, and that's um, freight and heavy duty. So what is the RNG uh, landscape? And why are local governments so significant? Local governments control... Um, some of the most accessible feedstocks, uh, centralized feedstocks, um, you know, separated organic sewage sludge, and also existing landfills. Um, the, the organics and the sewage sludge can be sent to anaerobic digesters to generate biogas. Our landfill gas, with some upgrading, uh, can go into biogas to uh, generate combined heat and power. And what is happening... Um, in places like particularly Scandinavia, and the opportunity we have here is incredible dynamism in how natural gas is being used. Um, so we need upgraders to move from biogas to biomethane, which is renewable natural gas. And what we're going to see is hopefully um, the preservation of, 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 of methane for industry. Uh, natural gas and, and methane are so valuable notably for their capacity to generate high temperature heat, which is really needed in so many industrial applications. Um, we're we're going to be really challenged on the short term to be able to figure out what we're going to do to decarbonize heavy-duty uh, trucks, short haul, and notably, um, uh, notably freight. So what we're likely to see, if we're smart 
uh, as a jurisdiction is ramping up um, the penetration of uh, methane in, in uh, heavy duty trucks and, and long distance uh, freight. At the same time, what we'll likely see is a drop in natural gas in, in the building sector, both existing buildings and new construction. And that'll happen a much, much more uh, uh, gradually in, in, in the existing building sector. But this is an incredibly dynamic field that requires a huge amount of regulatory and, 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 and policy reform uh, nationally, provincially, uh, and locally to be able to stick handle this. When we take a look at the potential of local governments for generating renewable natural gas, it's really quite significant in the order of three to nine petajoules a year. What does that mean in terms of GHG reductions? About you know, a half megaton, half million tons of GHGs to one and a half million tons of GHGs. That's really significant when we think about we have to achieve about a 25 megaton reduction between now and 2030, which is only about 12 years away. So the local government role in this space is really, really uh, important. In communities, in, in, in urban regions like Vancouver, um, it's, uh, Greater Vancouver, uh, Southern Vancouver Island, Kelowna, uh, Upper Fraser Valley, Kamloops, um, it's likely we're going to be able to have the economies of scale for um, generating renewable natural gas. In some of our smaller communities, um, uh, we're probably going to see a need for real collaboration with the agricultural sector and the forestry sector to achieve some of the scales uh, that are going to be necessary to justify um, those, um, uh, th 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 those investments. We want to know from you um, later on in our discussion, what kind of guidance local governments really need, uh, and also what kind of policy reforms are needed locally, provincially, and, and federally. So without further ado, what I would like to do is introduce our first key speaker, and she uh, is the, 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 she's the, the stick handler with Energy Mines and Petroleum Resources uh, on um, uh, innovative natural gas uh, strategies. In the, the heavy duty um, uh, truck sector, um, but also in this space around renewable natural gas. And one of the really important things that she managed over the last well, uh, two years that came out in March of last year was an excellent, excellent study um, that looks at the renewable natural gas potential in, 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 in British Columbia. And she's going to speak to that. She's been with the provincial government for 15 years, so she has a wealth of experience and knowledge in understanding multiple climate plans and multiple energy plans. And we're going to hear what's happening right now in updating two of those important um, uh, plans. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jennifer Davison to the stage. Do I have to do anything? Ah, OK. Great. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. I was speaking with a, a colleague this morning. Only five, ten years ago, people didn't really know what RNG was. They didn't really talk about it. But now, it's, just look around in this room. There are about 100 people in this room coming to hear me, little old me, talk about RNG. It's become the new, the new sexy topic <laughs> in industry. I love talking about RNG, so thank you for coming. I want to just set the stage for what we're talking about today. 61. That's a really big number. I made it really big because it's a really big number. 61 megatons of GHGs in 2015. Now, believe it or not, we're, that's one of the smallest per capita in all of Canada. But that's a really big number. I can't even imagine what that even looks like. Well, your average jumbo jet, about 487 tons. Your average SUV, about four tons. And a metric ton looks about like a two-story house. So if you can visualize, we talk about 61 megatons. We're talking about SUVs, jumbo jets, and two-story houses. So pretend 
that I have 15 million SUVs on this slide, or pretend that I have 61 million two-story houses on this slide. And that's the number we're talking about. And the provincial government is intent on getting that number down. That's what we're working on. And RNG can help with that. You'll also hear us talk today about gigajoules. Well, what's a gigajoule? Well, one gigajoule is the equivalent in energy from running your laptop 24 hours a day for 231 days. So more than half a year. Oh, it's okay. Uh, oh. For video purposes. Sorry, do I have to repeat that all over again? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. A petajoule, that's also a big number. One petajoule is about seven and a half million US gallons of gasoline. So seven and a half million of those containers. And an average mill in British Columbia will use about one to two petajoules a year. So that's a lot of energy. So I'm here today, here today, to talk to you about what we're doing in the provincial government. Now, there are colleagues of mine here from other agencies, from our climate action and forest sectors, but I'm here to talk to you today about what RNG means for the Ministry of Energy, Mines, and Petroleum Resources. My ministry is responsible for alternative energy in the province, and that includes sectors like biogas, uh, geothermal, wind, solar, ocean, hydro, all the fun things. But why is this relevant for RNG? Why would the Ministry of Energy and Mines be interested in RNG specifically? Well, in 2016, the Canadian Gas Association committed a, to a new national RNG target. Canada's natural gas utilities set a target of 5% RNG blended natural gas in the pipeline by 2025 and 10% by 2030. So where are we coming from? In British Columbia, we've had a long history of looking at alternative fuels, climate action programs. In fact, we're one of the leaders in Canada. British Columbia and Quebec are the leading provinces in this country looking at alternative fuels and alternative energy. We started in 20, uh, 2007 with our energy plan, where we formally committed to looking at alternative energy production. We then developed our climate action plans, our bioenergy strategy, and then a number of different uh, progressive policies, such as a renewable and a low carbon fuel standard. British Columbia is the only province in the country that has both renewable fuel requirements and a low carbon fuel requirement. We have a Clean Energy Act. We have a number of collaborations with other states and provinces in the western part of North America. And in 2017, we announced the very first RNG Renewable Portfolio Allowance. And I'll tell you a bit about that. On your tables, I've left copies of our executive summary for our resource supply potential study that Alec was uh, referencing just moments ago. We were very proud of this. This study, we looked at the achievable and the technical potential of RNG in this province. We are very firm in our conclusions because we had it peer reviewed. Not only was it led or worked on by government, sorry, ministry staff in the in energy and mines, we worked with our two natural gas utilities, Pacific Northern Gas and Fortis BC. And we also collaborated with our ministries of agriculture, forests, and environment. So we're pretty satisfied with the conclusions made, and everybody's in agreement with these conclusions. So what does this mean? What, now that we know, what do we do with it? Well, our Clean Energy Act, under, uh, that I referenced earlier, allows what's called a prescribed undertaking. 
Now this is directed strictly at public utilities in the province, so Fortis BC, BC Hydro, Pacific Northern Gas. It allows a public utility to acquire RNG up to a maximum price. It also allows the utilities to acquire RNG up to a certain volume. And we as government are allowing all the costs of these programs to be recovered by all ratepayers. So you, me, everybody in this room, whether we use RNG or not, we're still paying for it. And the reason we did that is because that we believe that everybody benefits from lower carbon natural gas in the system. On the demand side, what does an RPA do? Well, it'll increase the demand in our transportation sector for natural gas. It'll increase the demand under our low carbon fuel standard and our renewable fuel requirements. It'll allow our utilities to increase RNG in the transportation sector and to contribute to a low carbon economy. On the supply side, our farming community is working very closely with government to increase supply from our local farms. In our forest sector, we're working closely with forest companies and other communities to try and get that fiber out to make RNG. And our municipalities are already collecting waste and turning that into a viable fuel for their own operations. But that is only the first step. Our intention is to establish a renewable portfolio standard which will make it mandatory for utilities to purchase RNG. It allows the utility, sorry, never mind. So the opportunities for increasing both the demand and supply for RNG and reductions in GHG emissions are significant. I'm very pleased to be here and look forward to an exciting and engaging agenda. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Typically, we uh, webcast these events. Unfortunately, as a result of convocation today, our uh, creative staff are completely tapped out. But we are videotaping this and it'll be available subsequent. If you are wanting to tweet at all, you can at hashtag RECities. Um, uh, we will be distributing this quite broadly. There were a lot of people that were interested from other parts of the province that weren't able to make it today whatsoever. I have a question for you, Jennifer, um, because there's a lot of work going on on a new roadmap, energy roadmap, and a new climate plan that is likely out in the fall in some way. How is this report being used to inform our understanding of what we're, we will be able to achieve out of that technical potential. Um, and if you could use the microphone right here, that would be great. Thank you, Alec. Uh, well, um, we're still developing both the Climate Action Plan and our energy roadmap. So I don't have a lot to tell you today, but I can tell you we're looking at new ways of doing things. So trying to be innovative, trying to do things in a sustainable way. BC is already ahead of the curve. We're already very clean. So it's getting harder and harder to get cleaner and to reduce our GHGs. So the key words there are innovation, sustainability, and, uh, and, um, and jobs. Great. Uh, I, um, I I'm assuming that the, the province is really keen on hearing about other innovative ideas that the, the audience may have. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, the next speaker that we have is from a really innovative uh, municipality in British Columbia, and we are, we're really lucky. There's more action happening in communities in British Columbia than any other jurisdiction in North America, potentially with the exception of California, and even then it would be very competitive, and largely that is due to uh, some tremendous work that the provincial government did in collaboration with local governments 2007 to establish the Climate Action Charter, uh, which was the first jurisdiction in the world to actually require local governments to set targets and policies and actions to, to achieve them. Um, a lot has happened. Uh, the city of Surrey has really stepped up to the plate. Um, I developed their community energy plan in collaboration with them um, 
five, six, seven years ago, and RNG was on the agenda there, and it was, it was a completely obscure issue. But the city of Surrey has again and again, in terms of um, new construction, uh, ex existing buildings, uh, the, uh, the, the work that they're doing to extend their district energy system is really uh, um, light years ahead of so many other jurisdictions in, in Canada. And Ella Zukowska is managing the Surrey Biofuel Project, and, uh, which is something that all municipalities, should, and, and particularly regional districts, should have a, some great, greater insight into. She's also managing the Solid Waste Management Services of the city of Surrey and its really successful efforts at managing organic diversion. So, Ella Zukowska. Thank you for the introduction, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really um, happy to be here today and have the opportunity to present on Surrey's biofuel project. Um, I'm especially thrilled to hear that uh, the project is a catalyst for the discussion um, on advancing local governments and um, opportunities in developing of the um, of the RNG. I think I'll, this will help. All right. Well, so um, the biofuel project story uh, began nearly 10 years ago. As Alex mentioned, policy is driving the initiatives in the city of Surrey. So in 2009, the city established a vision uh, to fuel Surrey waste collection trucks with renewable natural gas generated from Surrey organic waste that is collected at the curbside. So how did the city do that? The city um, achieved that vision in two phases. Phase one, was implemented in 2012, when was initiated in 2012, when the city implemented its um, new waste, sustainable waste management program called Rethink Waste. As part of that program, the city mandated source separation of kitchen waste from a garbage <coughs> carts to organic cart. While weekly organics collection continued, uh, the city uh, collection of garbage was reduced to alternating bi-weekly collection. At the same time, the city purchased 100% compressed natural gas fleet of collection vehicles. Uh, we did purchase it through our waste collection contractors. Uh, what, uh, what would be the phase two then? Phase two links closely to phase one, and it's an establishment of the city biofuel facility that, that, would, um, that would process organic waste collected at the curbside into renewable natural gas for fueling vehicles that co collect that organic waste at the curbside. Let's look at the highlights of the facility. In 2014, the city um, following, I'm sorry, in 2014, following the market competition, the city has uh, selected Orga World Canada, a private partner with uh, which the city entered into a private contract for 25 years to design, build, finance, maintain, and operate the facility. The capital cost of the project was estimated at $67.6 .6 million. The key element to success of the facility was the contribution of the Government of Canada. The contribution was up to, was 25%, up to 16.9 million. Surrey's risks with that approach were limited to providing, providing land and organic waste tonnages for the plant, paying tipping fees over the 25 years, and ownership of the RNG. Orga world risks, on the other hand, were uh, to provide private financing and waste tonnages from the commercial sector. 
They also have a responsibility of guaranteeing volumes of um, renewable natural gas and marketing the compost product. Now I'd like to show that video, which Alex, do we have this? I'm not sure. Are we going to be able to show that video at all? We, we had one of our challenges was <laughs> the volume of videos. All right. That, I'll, that, I'll tweet it into the hashtag. If you want perfect. To see it. Yeah, the video is available on surreybiofuel.ca website, and there are also two additional videos. This one specifically talks about the policy side of things, and to speak to it very briefly, it alludes to the Sustainability Charter, uh, Climate Action, Surrey Climate Action Plan, and um, Metro Vancouver uh, Solid Waste Management Plan. Uh, it also tells you that uh, how the closed loop approach uh, works. Uh, closed loop basically means that we are closing that loop where organic waste collected at the curbside is processed into renewable natural gas and the compost product. Compost product is being taken back to the local farmers and landscapers and the renewable natural gas is used to fuel the vehicles that collect that organic waste. So some numbers now. And um, I'll try to keep it to just those few. There are many numbers associated with that project. But first off, the biofuel facility uses tunnel composting technology alongside dry anaerobic digestion technology. It's designed to process 115,000 metric tons of organic waste per year, which is enough to um, process all of the city residential waste for right now and 25 years from now. It will produce 120,000 gigajoules of um, renewable natural gas per year. That is enough to fuel the entire fleet of waste collections vehicles and our growing fleet of service vehicles. It will also produce approximately 45,000 tons of nutrient-rich class A compost material. Again, that will be used, uh, some of it, it will be used in city corporate operations, but it will also be marketed to local food growers and landscapers. And last but not least is the facility will reduce carbon emissions by 40,000 tons a year. Um, that is equivalent of taking approximately 10,000 cars off the road each year. The biofuel facility has also an integrated learning and visitor center with an outdoor compost demonstration garden. Um, the structured workshops and tours will commence in the facility this fall. The biofuel has also a state-of-the-art odor mitigation system. Uh, the graphic behind me shows um, key components of that system, and I don't want to put you all to sleep, but <laughs> the highlights are, the important things are that the um, odor control system maintains constant negative pressure in the facility. That means that no odors from of daily operations are escaping. The ammonia scrubber is there to remove smelly ammonia molecules from the internal air. The internal air is then being passed through a series of biofilters. Biofilters are um, comprised of um, wood material. This wood material in biofilters is sprayed with water, and that is to facilitate the natural biological processes of cleaning the air. And last, uh, the filtered air is then sent to this through this 70, 70 meter tall stack uh, for to optimize the natural dispersion. So some highlights of sustainability benefits, there are a few. However, the reduction in corporate CO2 emission by 40,000 a year is, is an important one because it will eliminate the city's entire carbon footprint of 16,000 tons per year. And uh, it's, there's also enough to um, send the energy to the, our district energy system. 
It's not a secret that the Surrey Biofuel Facility has now become a new benchmark for sustainable waste management, and it's providing economic and environmental benefits to the region. It helps divert waste from the landfill. It helps reduce emissions and um, create new energy infrastructure, but it also is important in helping the city become more sustainable in its operations. While biofuel facilities uh, have been successful in Europe, the Surrey Biofuel Facility is first of its kind in, of its kind in North America, and this is due to our closed-loop compost uh, concept. I apologize. Um, today, I'm especially happy that. The facility is also a catalyst for those discussions at the local, um, also regional and national level, level. And we're happy to be here to share the lessons learned in, in the process of bringing this facility to life. Well, that concludes my presentation today. And thank you for your interest. And please keep in touch. <laughs>
a, a renewable fuel in our, in, our, in our pipelines. One of the great things that Fortis is doing um, in British Columbia is embedding um, uh, uh, community energy specialists uh, in local municipalities. And one of the roles that Dana has has, be, has been hiring those um, renewable energy, those community energy specialists, and also liaising with them and the local governments that are, she's collaborating with. So there's a dozen community energy specialists. And really, this is one of the innovative things that uh, British Columbia is doing. Fortis BC and BC Hydro um, putting community energy managers inside local governments to be able to look at uh, a variety of opportun opportunities for conserving uh, energy, but also looking at uh, district energy and other forms of renewable energy development. Dana Wong is the, the, the manager of pu public policy, and one of her uh, specific areas of focus is the whole area of the clean energy, clean energy economy. So Dana. I think we should have coordinated beforehand. You could have given my whole uh, presentation here. <laughs> <laughs> you stole my thunder, but that's okay. I still have a few things that we can chat about here today. So thank you, everybody. I'm really happy to be engaging with you on this conversation and, and to be a part of this important work that uh, SFU's Renewable Cities team is doing. So I'm going to start today by um, providing you with a bit of context in terms of Fort SBC, who we are and what we do. I will speak to our RNG program, its evolution, and where we are today. And then finally, as Alex mentioned, how we've been partnering with local governments to further advance renewable natural gas supply. So many of you in the room here today know Fortis, BC as the province's uh, biggest natural gas um, distributor, a utility. But what some of you might not know is that we also do deliver electricity, propane, alternative thermal energy solutions, um, to our 1.1 mil million customers throughout the province. We are deeply committed to energy solutions that address not just energy, but affordability, climate action, and economic development across the 135 communities that we serve. So why is Fortis BC interested in renewable natural gas? The reasons are many, but um, I'll talk about a few here today. First and foremost, it aligns uh, very well with government policy. It directly supports the government's newly legislated targets of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and 2040. And um, as for our customers, our customers, customers expect utilities to play a role in sustainability. So it's one way that we can serve. There is a certain segment of our customer population that really expects and wants a zero, a low carbon and zero carbon energy source. So this is one way that we can provide that energy to them. Fortis BC is also a critical link between our customers and the smaller scale energy suppliers in the renewable natural gas area. And Fortis BC is trusted to ensure that that energy is delivered both safely, reliably and cost effectively to our customers. And finally, renewable natural gas is an opportunity for Fortis BC to play a real leadership role in providing an innovative energy solution for BC that, it, that can address numerous challenges from waste, climate, um, waste, climate, energy, and also the environment. So our renewable natural gas program Renewable natural gas is the term that we use for biomethane, so upgraded biogas to pipeline quality biomethane. We began ten uh, in 2010 with our renewable natural gas supply development. We went to our regulator, the British Columbia Utilities Commission, and um, sought approval for a two-year pilot project, which we have since made into a permanent program. And in the past couple of years, we've had some regulatory and policy decisions, as Jennifer mentioned earlier about the 5% renewable portfolio allowance that we are allowed to put on our system, um, as well as the BCUC has allowed us to lower the price of renewable natural gas for customers to pay. So 
Uh, previously, the cost was about $10 um, a gigajoule, and it's now currently today, or, sorry, $14, and today it's currently sitting at about $10 per gigajoule. So the program itself is really a first of its kind in North America. It's the first time that um, a utility has been involved in this end-to-end -end energy delivery of renewable natural gas. So we are involved in the upstream, right through to the downstream, and delivery to our customers. And how it works is our customers tell us whether they want to procure a certain percentage of renewable natural gas, whether it's 5, 10, 20, even 100 percent renewable natural gas. And at that point, Fortis BC injects that amount of biomethane into the system. And so it effectively displaces the conventional natural gas that we procure. And of course, since renewable natural gas is a carbon neutral energy source, customers also see a credit on their bills for the carbon tax so that they would otherwise pay for that energy. Renewable natural gas is cost effective. It's uh, currently sitting, if you think about it in terms of kilowatt hours, uh, it's about six, just over six cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, when you think about electricity in this province, or at least um, utility delivered electricity sitting at about 10 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour, depending on where you live, it really is an effective way to meet your renewable energy goals um, in a carbon neutral way. Today we have about 9,600 customers who purchase renewable natural gas, and they can range anywhere from homeowners or residential customers to commercial customers, some of which you see are listed on the slide here behind me, to public sector organizations, the local governments and others who are using nat renewable natural gas to meet their carbon neutrality and sustainability requirements. Collectively, our customers, this demand um, accounted for about 230 gigajoules of RNG on our system last year. In terms of supply, we currently have five active RNG projects, two in the agricultural sector, um, two landfills, and most recently with the city of Surrey and their biogas facility. And what's interesting to note about our program and our, um, is the, the flexibility in terms of, on the supply side, our project partners can either choose to own and operate the upgrader and the capital infrastructure that's required to upgrade the biogas, or, if, for example, in the local government context, which might be important, they can choose to allow Fortis BC to own and operate that um, upgrading equipment and associated infrastructure. So the flexibility here, I think, for local governments would be key um, in terms of perhaps not wanting to take on that capital infrastructure requirement and the operational risk. And as Alex mentioned before, while we do have a, a full renewable natural gas team working on the program at Fortis BC, but in the past year, we've been partnering with local governments and indigenous communities to really ramp up, seek out what opportunities are out there still to ramp up our renewable natural gas supply. So whether it's um, education, informing and education, educating our stakeholders, or even mapping out all those waste stream sources that local governments might either own or have control over in the residential, commercial, institutional, industrial areas, starting to really map out what's there, how much of it is there, and how we can take advantage of those remaining opportunities. And <laughs> this is the stealing my thunder part. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with one final thought, and that is that we're here today talking about renewable natural gas as it's derived from biogas, right? Organic waste sources. But if I can open your minds a little bit and we think to the future, if I can cast a line out to tomorrow, we might be here talking about renewably sourced hydrogen and waste source hydrogen as renewable natural gas and how we can further use that to green up our natural gas supply. Thanks. I might have been the thunder, but I think Dana was the lightning. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather be the lightning. 
Um, thank you, uh, Dana, and thank you for, for our entire panel for, for priming a really good discussion. These events, and we do them quite frequently, wouldn't happen without the ongoing support of um, a number of really, really important institutions. We're, our, our core funding comes from the Sitka Foundation and the North Growth Foundation and also the SFU Center for Dialogue, which conceived this organization, Renewable Cities. And Re Renewable Cities was conceived with an original mandate to try and treble the number of cities committed to 100% renewable energy. And it has more more than um, uh, succeeded in collaboration with a number of organizations in the United States and in Europe. Um, we, we've more than quintupled the number of uh, cities committed to 100% uh, um, renewable uh, cities. What our task is now is really helping uh, drive the implementation agenda. So that's the, the next chapter in renewable cities uh, work. Um, this SFU has a strong commitment to engaging in dialogue and collaborative research to uh, tackle some of these really complex public policy issues that, that we confront. What I'd like to do right now is open the floor to anyone who's interested. Uh, please wait for the microphone. I think there's, are there two microphones coming around? Well, yeah. We might give one at the table here. So, so we'll, ha we'll have one, one at the one table. Over. So please wait because you are on camera. Um, and we will produ be producing a, a video out of this. Uh, once again, if you'd like to um, tweet, uh, hashtag RECities. And if people are shy coming forward, I know there's a number of people in the audience um, that I will actually go to because they have really important insights. And that's a, a, a real benefit of an audience like this in many ways. But a challenge for us is there's as much depth and breadth in the audience as there is up here on, on the stage. The one other um, uh, institution I'd like to mention that also makes our webcasts and, vi and videos possible is the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. And uh, Nishten Kakai is here representing PICS at SFU. Are there any questions? Great. Uh, okay. Sorry, a little tight in here. And if you could please mention your, your name or any affilia affiliation you have. Okay. Uh, Nelson Lee with Green, si Green Sky Sustainability. The question I have is, uh, has anybody looked at what potential, how, how much renewable natural gas is, you know, reasonably producible in, in the province? So, you know, how many customers could we get off of gas? Have a look at your table. Oh, it's right down there. Eh? Okay. <laughs> and I don't have a copy here, but that's it. It's there. That's okay. our executive summary. You can find the full report online. I just didn't, it's about 20 pages. I didn't want to print off that many copies. Right. But that will tell you what the, both the achievable and the technical potential are for agricultural waste, um, residential waste, landfill, uh, wastewater, and forestry. So, and the, and the, both the short term and the long term. Oh, sorry, uh, that's with uh, significant uh, technical advancements. So for example, in the wood waste industry, a lot of it is still economically not feasible to retrieve right now. We did include a forecast if new technology came on stream that made it more economically viable to retrieve it. Thank you, uh, Nelson. Nelson's with the, and I'm, I'm going to get it wrong because they've just rebranded themselves, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geologists. It's Engineers and Geoscientists BC. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and they're, they're playing a really important role in building the capacity of engineers, both on the adaptation and the mitigation side. And Nelson is one of the point people within, um, uh, within the rebranded organization because it's no longer APEG. Back here. Uh, Gordon Mose. I'm a, a consultant with Tetratech Canada. Yeah. Um, I work primarily with indigenous peoples across, across Canada. The question I have is, you partly answered it, uh, Jennifer. Um, and I see a big opportunity really with uh, forest waste. You know, I worked on the native side of that for many, many years. And as I was told, every tree has got a name on it. But what we see at the local level a lot of times is so much waste because they're sort of uh, high cropping. The best trees out there and everything else is thrown on the ground in a pile, and it goes up into the environment uh, as fire smoke. 
And so we're generating an awful lot of carbon through that. And again, with the pine beetle and uh, spruce budworm uh, trees that are down, and the huge number of forest fires that we're seeing every year as a consequence of that. Is, the, is there a vision somehow in government to make sure that uh, the companies are required by law to actually get that material, put it into a form, and take it out the same way that they take the trees out? Because I know that if we leave it to the forest companies to do this type of work, um, they'll bide their time and really, you know, it's a profitability uh, situation. Yes, it would cost an awful lot more for it, but uh, it, would, it would make the lumber more costly, but it would be something that is not being subsidized by the environment right now. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And also, uh, Dana, if, if you can envision how something like that might happen with respect to Fortis having facilities regionally that could actually take that material to put the gas in the system. Thank you. Really good questions. And, and Jennifer, if you're not able to entertain all of that question, I might even turn to Scott because uh, you're right. There are a lot of uh, forestry companies out there that aren't moving um, uh, very proactively. But fortunately in this province, there's a lot of forestry companies that are. And the, the whole bioeconomy uh, sector is, is quite strong but we have to make it stronger, um, and we have to do it in a, in a sustainable manner. So I, I'm going to open the floor to, to Jennifer first to respond, and then pass it to Scott, and there might sure. be others. Sure. You do a lot of stealing thunder, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just want to say I, I'm no expert in the forest side. Um, I think I will if Scott has anything to add to this. But I agree 100% with everything you said. It's, uh, it's a real waste. It's uh, not being used appropriately. I know that our Ministry of Forests is looking at a fiber action plan, some way of trying to retrieve that fiber and working with communities. Um, as you know, it's very expensive to get it out, uh, especially in more remote parts of the province. Um, but you're right. It's, it, it's a resource that's being laid to waste, no pun intended, uh, that can be used effectively. Um, and I don't know, Scott, if your organization may be able to provide some more information on that. Thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, so one, um, one Sorry, thing in the... Could you hear your full name and organization? Yes, yes. Uh, my name is Scott Stanners. I'm the executive director of BC Bioenergy Network. Uh, so the, um, uh, the mandate letter to the Ministry of Environment contained a, uh, a directive around putting a carbon tax on slash. Uh, in the forest. And so I think they're looking at that and trying to figure out how they can do that. Uh, as Jennifer said, there's a big problem with um, the affordability or actually going to retrieve that. And so I think they're trying to figure out how do they find a balance between the primary harvesters and the secondary companies, mainly the uh, wood pellet producers. Uh, how do they find a, you know, an even line where they can uh, cooperate it on, on an economic basis? Uh, but to your point, uh, Bernard Kurtz with the Nat Natural Resources Canada, uh, has looked at this and said even our forest fires last year uh, provided a significant uh, impact on climate, you know, generated significant emissions and that our, our slash burning practices generate about 5 million tons a year. And so it's an issue that really has to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> I'm working with a, a handful of people in the uh, province, uh, even I know Gordon Flo here is uh, looking at this issue as well of uh, if if, uh, if there is excess fiber, what are, what are the opportunities for it? And we are looking at woody biomass to RNG conversion as one opportunity. And if those of you don't know, TetraTech is a real leader when it comes to uh, a number of areas in the waste sector. And I, you, you make a, an important contribution to the work of, of local governments and small um, communities around BC and the rest of Canada. Dana? Sure, yeah. So as I understand it, the technology for um, biomass gasification of woody waste sources isn't quite there yet at a commercial scale. So we have no plans for such a plant at this time. Um, I know that there is a pilot that the federal government is also involved in, um, and we will look forward to when uh, <laughs> costs can come down and, and that technology can be proven. Other questions? We'll go here, oh. and then Andy. Hi, my name is John Tack. I'm the former president of the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. 
Um, thank you, um, Jennifer, Ella, Ella and um, Dana for your presentations. My question is for Dana regarding the hydrogen injection study. Um, do you have any more uh, details on that and who are the partners in that study? Yeah, so um, we've partnered with Lonsdale Energy Corporation in the city of North Vancouver to um, examine the feasibility and the technical requirements of injecting waste hydrogen into the natural gas or the district energy system there. And, and what's the state of the study? Uh, so what is, what is the state of the study? Um, in progress. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to... Uh, because I, I suspect that there's going to be another hydrogen question. I'm going to go to Andy Wright, who's an adjunct professor at Pacific uh, Center for Water Resources, who's actually one of our advisors, along with his colleague, uh, Nas Nasterine Ariampu, um, on, on the project. Andy. Thank you, Alex. I was a little perturbed to see the 5% cap. Could you put some color on where that comes from and why is there a cap? Surely we should make as much of this stuff as we can, as opposed to using fossil fuels. Uh, the 5% was what our utilities estimated they could achieve in the short term. So the combination between Fortis BC and PNG estimated that 5% would be a reasonable amount over the next few years, and then we would revisit it. So it's by no means a permanent cap, it's to see how, you know, how long it takes us to get there and then what we can do beyond that. Do you have a supplementary question? My, the supplemental would be, is my concern, is that it stops innovation. And, you know, one of the big problems is the scarcity of fuel on the land and bringing those resources together. If you put a cap on, it's going to stop people thinking, I know how to solve that problem in a different way. And, and that, that's my concern, is it, it limits the rate at which innovation m moves into, into the system. I, I think you might be getting at that tension, or there, at the end of the day, Fortis BC is a public utility, and we, um, we are bound to serve our energy at the lowest reasonable cost to our customers. So the BC, we have to apply to the BCUC to, um, how do I say this? Um, for, for any changes to the programs, and, and the BCUC ultimately determines that level of risk that um, we can take on. So I, I think what one could glean from that, a Andy, is your recommendation is not necessarily that the 5% is inappropriate on the short term, but there should be other targets and timelines attached so that we don't uh, constrain the innovation. Um, if, uh, if there are perspectives from the Utility Commission, I know there's a number of, of people from BCUC here. Um, Can I, I just say something oh, sorry, more on that, Alex? Jennifer, sorry. Yes. Um, also, with the regulation where we have that 5% uh, cap, that regulation is, um, it was basically the minister telling the British Columbia Utilities Commission to allow the utilities to do this. And so 5% is still perceived as an acceptable amount right now because, as Dana mentioned, ratepayers are paying for it, for one. And also, it, it, it's, um, it's exempt from, it's not exempt from Utility Commission reg, um, oversight, but it's a program that is um, not regulated the same way the other utility activities are. So we didn't want to go too far, you know, and too far up that ladder without being able to revisit the program and amend it as we could over the short term. So I just want to re-emphasize it's not a permanent cap. It's something to revisit when we see progress. We have a question right here. Oh, okay. We'll Sorry, Alex, I'll do one. Follow up from Siraz Dalmir, who's with Fortis BC. With Fortis BC, yeah. Just to add some color to the target and what it really means in terms of today's current situation. 5% uh, is where we're trying to get to. We are currently at just under half a percent. So we're trying to achieve an order of magnitude of increase. So we expect we're going to get a significant amount of innovation in this time. But you know, also to Jennifer's point, when we're getting closer to 5%, we expect that that cap, as we call it, will likely shift into something entirely different. But yeah, we, so we've got a bit of work to do, which is also why everyone's here in the room uh, today because we want to try and 
get that order of magnitude of increase. Thanks. Thanks. And then we'll go right here. Uh, if you have a microphone front right. Uh, Owen Finn, My Seat of Sky. Um, forgive my ignorance in the subject, but maybe a question to Jennifer would be, uh, is there a plan to classify hydrogen derived from electrolysis as a, a renewable uh, entity? Um, and second of all, I'm curious as to the economics of doing that. Can you shed any light on that? Yes, and I have no idea. <laughs> uh, yes, we are looking actively at hydrogen production, uh, especially around the transportation sector. The cost, I'm not, I don't know that. I can't answer that question. There's somebody in the audience. We have a hydrogen table. Right? Um, my name is Mike Templeton. Uh, I'm with uh, a private organization, Northwest Organics to Biogas. Okay. We're developing biogas projects. But just as an aside to that comment, uh, my partner's involved in a project in Quebec, which is basically uh, hydrolyzation into, uh, of electricity. The key to the math in the business case of that scenario is very cheap electricity. So yeah. Quebec is one of the few areas in the world where that exists, and so the math is looking promising, and they're involved right now um, at developing a project in Quebec on that exact topic. To, to hitchhike on that, and I don't know if you have another qu uh, question, but uh, Quebec and Ontario have actually collaborated on a blue corridor um, for LNG and CNG and heavy-duty trucks with the expectation that over the long term, a growing share of that fuel is going to become becoming from renewable natural gas. I don't know if the hydrogen project is part of that, uh, but it's another uh, exciting way to see this transformation of the marketplace. If there... Yeah, I'm Consul Lee from Korean Consulate. I have two questions. First one uh, is to Ella. Uh, how big is the capacity of the uh, sorry biofuel, <coughs> sorry, uh, power plant in terms of the, uh, you know, the generation of power, the mega megawatts? So the facility is designed to generate about 120,000 gigajoules of uh, RNG per year. Okay, I I need to calculate that, <laughs> but just just for your yeah. So we've uh, looked at those numbers um, in um, more practical applications. That would be equivalent to heating about uh, um, 1,000 to 1,500 house, houses uh, per year. All right. I, Go ahead. Okay, yeah, just for your information, uh, uh, Sudokwon Landfill Management Corporation in Korea, uh, they also is running um, 50 megawatts uh, uh, power, landfill power plant uh, since 2007. Uh, it's only 0.5% uh, of the Korea's uh, power, the power generation, but it is a huge amount of you know, power. So our, our renewable natural gas roadmap project involves ostensibly two, uh, two, two components. Uh, one of them is a, a, a local government uh, roadmap, which is essentially to provide guidance to local governments uh, around how to evaluate uh, the, the, uh, um, the potential, the technical potential um, to generate renewable natural gas in their, in their own communities and also offer uh, uh, different uh, pathways when it comes to uh, the, the business models that may be, may be undertaken and provide some insight into the technological pathways as well particularly in those communities that don't have the capacity, don't have the scale, what are the opportunities for aggregation in your communities? Um, and maybe what are some opportunities if you're not able to generate RNG for smaller scale projects that are generating uh, um, uh, biogas for combined heat and power systems? So that's, that project involved, has an, uh, an advisory board. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer Davison on the advisory board from Energy Mines and Petroleum Resources, and Dana um, Wong from Fortis BC, who's on our advisory board. And we have Andy Wright and Nastarine from Pacific Water Resources from SFU who are on the advisory board. And this project was made possible initially from the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, a, a funding agency that was uh, created by the, the, the BC uh, government. So one of the things that we will be doing over the next uh, 
a year, uh, well, le less than a year, about six month period, is designing this, uh, this guidebook to help um, support local governments as they navigate uh, th this future. So we'd like to hear some feedback from, uh, from you on that. We have an intern, um, and his name is Mashtaba Rajdavardi. Um, he is Iranian, and I don't know if you know this, but one of the historic, most important biogas innovators in the world was actually uh, the Persian Empire. Uh, there was more biogas activity in, in, in Persia than almost anywhere else in the world, with the exception of the other part of the world, was actually in, um, in, in China and, and in Korea. Um, and literally, that was discovered in the 13th century, but some of the, our first consular staff that existed in the world, and they actually came from, from Italy, and that was Marco Polo and his colleagues that discovered that in the 13th century when they, they, they went to China and for the first time heard about um, the Republic of Korea, in actual fact. The other part of our project um, is a policy options paper, and... Um, that is something that, uh, uh, and I, I would say that the, the, the local government uh, roadmap is something that we're collaborating quite closely with Fortis on as well. They're a partner in that project. The policy options paper is something that um, uh, we're doing independently, but it's to help answer some of those questions and provide some strategic guidance around some of the policy and regulatory uh, and capacity building uh, initiatives that we really have to undertake to grow uh, this industry and accelerate the market transformation of renewable natural gas in British Columbia. And uh, that is something that we will uh, be developing over the, six, the next six months. I'd really like to thank PIX, uh, the Sitka Foundation and the North Growth Foundation and SFU for being able to support projects like this on an ongoing basis. Uh, Fortis BC is an important partner uh, on this project and so they also help um, um, they're helping make this project possible and really like to thank uh, the, 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 the Korean consulate. Um, the, the, it, it can't be underestimated the important work um, that is the uh, consular offices play in helping with knowledge exchange and also helping with um, trade and helping um, create markets in their domestically uh, and, and internationally. And there's huge opportunities for both uh, British Columbia and Korea to uh, grow on this. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam. Um, we wouldn't be here um, uh, if it wasn't for, uh, wasn't for them. And thank you very much to our panelists. And you will be hearing from us. If you have the time to be able to fill out an evaluation, we greatly appreciate your feedback. We can make initiatives like this even better if you tell us uh, how we can do that. Thank you very much.